Well, there are two main types of stroke. There is a type of stroke in which there's a lack of blood supply to the brain called a cerebral infarction or ischemic stroke, and that's about 85% of strokes. There's also a bleeding type of stroke, intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage, and that means that blood spills outside of the artery into the brain tissue and leads to damage of the brain tissue in that way. So again, ischemic stroke, a lack of blood supply to the brain, the nerve cells become lacking in oxygen and then begin to die off. And then there's the bleeding type of stroke in which there's a fragile uh, aspect of the artery leading to blood spilling into the brain tissue. You know, for the most part, both of the types of stroke can affect people in the same type of way. And the symptoms that we want people to be aware of, that is the symptoms of presentation of stroke include the sudden onset of weakness in the face, arm, or leg, sudden onset of numbness, that is inability to feel face, arm, and leg, sudden inability to talk, sudden inability to understand others, sudden visual change, sudden unsteadiness or dizziness. It can all occur at presentation of stroke. A sudden unexplained headache, unlike anything a person has had before, that can occur particularly in one of the types of a bleeding type of stroke. And so that's an important symptom as well. But again, headache by itself is not necessarily a key feature of stroke, but if it's a sudden headache, unlike anything they've had before, that can be important. Oftentimes, a person would be cognizant of those symptoms. They'd be aware of that sudden weakness, sudden numbness, the slurring of their speech and inability to say what they would like to, and they'd be very frustrated. Uh, sudden unsteadiness, they uh, sense, uh, have a good sensation of that, sudden difficulty seeing. So all of these, they would be quite cognizant of those uh, symptoms. In other cases, for example, the difficulty comprehending somebody else, that might be a setting where somebody else would find a person to come across as confused or just not able to interact with them in the usual way. But many of the symptoms that occur at the onset of a stroke, a person would be aware of themselves. If you or a friend or loved one has some of those symptoms mentioned earlier, the key issue is to seek emergency medical care because there are potential treatments available to try to reduce the deficit, the difficulty that might be apparent over the long term. So again, the key issue, if you're having symptoms such as I described a moment ago, to dial 911, seek emergency medical care so that we can very quickly evaluate that patient and implement some urgent therapies. Those are the, really the key initial steps. The United States FDA has approved use of the clot dissolving therapy for use up to three hours after onset of symptoms for intravenous use. That is giving the clot buster directly into the vein. Now there is information from a large research study that has shown us that it appears that that drug is effective from three to 4.5 hours as well. And so most national guidelines, both in the United States and beyond, do support the use of intravenous clot buster even between three to 4.5 hours. The FDA hasn't approved it at this point in time, but it is an option that has been agreed upon by the major organizations, neurological and emergency department and other organizations uh, in the United States and beyond. And so we have those intravenous options up to four and a half hours. And then we also have options directly into the artery, that is placing a little plastic catheter directly into the artery. The, art or the catheter is typically put in, in the groin artery and advanced all the way up into the brain. And we can sometimes use clot dissolving therapies, medicines that is, or there are what we call devices, mechanical devices that can be used to actually pull out the clot or the blockage that's present in the artery. And so those are available for beyond that time frame as well. We'll sometimes use those up to six to eight hours after onset of stroke in the front part of the brain, and even longer than that for arteries that are occurring in the back part of the brain. Okay. The issue of whether to take aspirin or not at the onset of these symptoms has been debated because as you point out, the difference between heart attack and stroke is that there is a bleeding type of stroke that is present in about 15% of cases. 
Now, it ends up that we're probably not going to significantly affect the size of the bleed if a person takes an aspirin at onset of symptoms. And about 85 to 90 percent of the time, they'd be correct in taking that aspirin. So it's reasonable. If a person has a sudden onset of weakness, numbness, difficulty speaking, and so on, as I outlined earlier, uh, it's reasonable to go, ahead, to go ahead and take an aspirin at that point while proceeding to emergency medical care. The concept of a stroke center comes from the major accreditation agency of hospitals in the United States called the Joint Commission. And several years ago, they had developed very specific and rigorous criteria for allowing a hospital to be certified as a primary stroke center. There are fortunately many hospitals, both small and large hospitals around the country that have now dedicated themselves to excellence in stroke scale or in excellence in stroke care and that have allowed them to receive accreditation as a primary stroke center. The next step is the development of criteria for what's called a comprehensive stroke center indicating that these, there's even a higher level of resources available even beyond the primary stroke center. So that is just coming into place currently and more centers are now applying for what are called comprehensive stroke center. It's going to be a much smaller group of medical centers because the resources required are quite significant. So it'll be a much smaller number of medical centers than the, those that have primary stroke center certification. We in the neurology community continue to want to increase the proportion of people who have an acute stroke who receive the most aggressive and optimal care, oftentimes clot dissolving therapies. But in order to do that, we need to extend our care beyond just major medical centers where a stroke subspecialist neurologist may be present and extend it out to rural communities that even though they have excellent care providers in that setting, have CAT scan availability immediately, they may not have a neurologist or a vascular neurologist available who can help to guide them. And that ties into the concept of telestroke initiatives. And what that means is via a video and audio connection done via computer to this rural hospital, we can make a direct and immediate connection with that patient from a major medical center where the vascular neurologist is present to that rural site that has the equipment available to connect by an audio, <clears throat> excuse me, an audio and video connection. Likewise, the neurologist at the primary site can review the CAT scan via that audio and video connection as well. And that allows us to extend our reach of the most aggressive and optimal care for acute stroke into rural communities that perhaps would not have had that available before. And there are telestroke networks that are uh, rapidly growing both at each of the Mayo Clinic sites in Rochester, Minnesota, Arizona, and in Florida as well as other telestroke uh, programs throughout the country and beyond.